Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to Dr. Christopher Mott, an IR scholar at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. Chris recently published a brilliant article on the ebb and flow of what could be described as some form of periodic McCarthyism in the United States. The long and extensive piece that he wrote, it's nearly 5,000 words, uh, is entitled Cycles of Mania and the Cancelling of the American Mind. This is the argument we are going to explore today. So welcome back, Chris. It's my pleasure to be back. Uh, Chris, this piece was really fantastic. And I'm going to link it, of course, down in the in uh, in the description. Uh, but could you maybe give us the main argument of how you're constructing this kind of ups and downs of of the U.S. mania? Right. <laughs> so my main argument here was to uh, notice that we have these periods, in, particularly uh, in in kind of media discourse, but in general around national security, that tend to follow the logic of moral panics. And the most famous national security oriented moral panic in history is, of course, the uh, era of uh, Senator Joe McCarthy in the early 1950s. And uh, so that the, the phrase McCarthyism works its way into a lot of things, but this phenomenon predates that. Um, in the particularly American context that I talk about, it actually, I make the case started with uh, Woodrow Wilson in the First World War and the immense amount of controls uh, over the press, especially related to uh, how the war was covered, even before U.S. entry into the war. There, there was some element of this, and it would turn out later in the 1920s, by the way, that British intelligence had played a massive role in shaping US public opinion towards the First World War before official entry um, in the country. And this actually is one of the major uh, reasons that led to what we now often incorrectly refer to as the kind of isolationist backlash of the interwar period was this kind of understanding that, that Americans had been manipulated to fight on behalf of the British Empire, which was uh, all the way until World War II was seen as a rival great power um, by the United States and had been its primary enemy in the 19th century. So um, this this is like, a, ever since then, there's had been a periodic kind of return to a creation of a public narrative uh, where moral the logic of moral panic is used to basically accuse anyone who is critical of the uh, kind of hyper fixation of official state enemies and official state foreign policy narratives to be a kind of foreign dupe of some kind. And then this has reoccurred time and time again. It, it definitely occurred in the 2000s after 9-11 uh, and was specifically in the context even of like cancellation, right? The, the Dixie Chicks famously were canceled, if you will, before the time that that was really a phrase used informally uh, for criticizing the president publicly in uh, I believe 2002 or 2003 um, while they were touring abroad and they were like a really really famous band at that time and much of their career got got kind of destroyed you know they, they went to not being like a mainstream success so much uh, later on because they kind of got hounded out of public life for uh, basically taking a crap on Bush uh, which was their right you know their, their constitutional right to do so um, uh, so, you know, even in my own lifetime, we've had these kind of things, you know, why do you hate freedom? You know, why do you love the terrorists? This kind of thing. Um, and it, it's a reoccurring thing that is part of the dynamic that plays between the establishment press and the establishment kind of uh, foreign policy thing, which is narrative creation and, and the, the kind of policing the boundaries of what is acceptable critique of foreign policy and what is not acceptable critique. And, um, of course, the most... Uh, We've actually seen a couple different uh, reoccurrences of, of this uh, in recent years. Uh, Russia Gate obviously is a big one. <laughs> uh, basically, going from uh, technically it started before the 2016 election, but really taking off immediately after the 2016 election. There's actually a very good book written by an insider of, of the Clinton campaign called Shattered, uh, which actually discusses how uh, John Podesta and co wanted to absolve themselves for their immense hubris and competence, waging what it was probably the most well-funded presidential campaign in history, uh, and the one that I think most people expected to win uh and, and running that campaign into the ground and the the very night of the election they had already in the in the talking room before they conceded came up with their excuse um and then this was written by someone who was like inside this 
milieu, this book. So so it wasn't like a hostile, meant to be a hostile hit piece, but they had intentionally kind of concocted this idea that we're going to pin it all on Russia. Um, and so that that really caused something that was already a theory percolating out there to really take off. Um, and so Russia Gate, of course, took over this country's public discourse for at least three years, if not four years. Um, and also, I would I would say, and I'm saying this as someone who is <laughs> no fan of 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 Trump or the January six people, but um, when when people rightly criticize those people for being election denialists for failing to accept the 2020 election, I think we all have to remember the context here was that for four years we dealt with a a, a election denialist from the other political party, um, claiming that a foreign actor had had somehow changed the vote tallies, changed uh, swayed voters with memes that nobody ever saw that were posted publicly on these random Facebook accounts. Uh, <laughs> but somehow this narrative spiraled and spiraled and became this ridiculous story uh, about um, the the uh, Putin basically choosing who the president of the United States was. Uh, this also uh, corresponded with a few other national security manias in the Trump years. Uh, a big and particularly ridiculous one that I always like to bring up is uh, the uh, Havana syndrome, right? There was the uh, whole belief by many people that worked uh, at the State Department and many other organizations that they were being poisoned by some kind of sonic weapon that had been deployed in uh, against the U.S. Embassy in Havana and a few other places, too. Uh, but there was never any physical evidence for this whatsoever. Uh, analyzations of the sounds people claim to have heard turned back that it was crickets. Um, <laughs> there might have been a role of infrasound in there. Infrasound is actually an interesting phenomenon where people believe they see monsters and ghosts, but it's usually a, a, a tone under human hearing that affects their sensory perception. And in my personal opinion, it's probably the explanation for most supernatural uh, phenomenon that people claim to see. But um, it, 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 certain kinds of cricket tones can actually set this off. Um, so like, like, was there a ghost of anything there? I don't know, but it sure as hell wasn't an intentionally deployed weapon. And it really came across as kind of a hypochondriac phenomenon where a bunch of people in a certain profession, in a certain field, all kind of had a collective delusion together. And of course, it's worth noting that the U U.S. Congress of course, voted because these are these are their employees. Voted to recompensate these people immediately and gave them pretty nice uh, compensatory packages uh, for their suffering. Uh, something that it, it, I have never seen such fast acting on on real medical issues that have come about due to say environmental pollution. But okay, <laughs> or, or or way way more money than anyone gets who just lost their houses in uh, Hawaii, right? I mean, oh so yeah, well. Yeah, <laughs> it goes without saying. Uh, we, we have seen a major natural disaster just unfold and, and the government response to it is quite lackluster, um, as it has been a couple other times in my lifetime, notably Hurricane Katrina. Um, so, uh, as you know, the old Confucians would have said, you know, you're, you're, you really know you're losing the mandate of heaven and you can't even... Uh, respond to a natural disaster correctly. But this is kind of the point of these national security uh, hypochondriac faces. Uh, and of course, the newest one is uh, any dissent on uh, US or NATO policy uh, regarding the Ukraine war is viewed as pro-Russia, which is it kind of brings us full circle back to McCarthy in a lot of ways. Um, but but these whole this whole thing kind of it exists in this way as a redirection uh, technique to to just say that there is no actual proper um, criticism of these policies that could not be uh, led by a foreign actor, whether whether the person in society is a willful dupe or not. The, the implication is only someone who uh, is is being influenced by a foreign actor could think these things. But in actuality, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> criticisms you can make from a lot of different directions and. It's uh, just a ridiculous uh, technique. And of course, it's a technique that much of the media is completely complicit in. And in fact, in, in some ways, is actually the fervent, most fervent uh, supporters of this narrative, even more than uh, actors in the government often are, uh, because it, it's, it drives up viewership. I mean, the, the whole formerly dying network of MSNBC entirely got a second wind at life due to Russiagate and being a kind of like pretending to be this kind of Russiagate thrill novel. Uh, explore it, come on guys, let's all get together and solve the mystery, you know, when we'll hold everyone accountable. And they got very famous for using the phrase, the walls are closing in over and over and over again, and nothing would ever happen. <laughs> so, yeah.
you know, I, I find I find it super interesting how your piece kind of connect, uh, connects uh, some of the small dots with the larger issue. So the larger issue, you're fr you're framing it as a moral contagion or kind of moral outrage that that keeps gripping the U.S. Uh, um, over and over again, right? But then there's these small events that keep happening and individual actors that kind of contribute to it. And then that system that, abu that abuses those moments, you're citing like Hamilton 68, you, you cite the Steele dossier um, in with the Clinton campaign and this whole Russiagate story that then spirals into the bigger moral outrage about Russia interfering with U.S. Uh, elections, which is a big, big no-go because the only one who's a, who's allowed to meddle with foreign elections is the United States. But if you turn that against us, I mean, ever, ever. Um, it, uh, but it's the the funny thing is, it's not even real, right? It's not. We this is absolutely debunked. But the the narrative is there, and a large part, even of the international community, now believes that uh, Claire Daly in the EU Parliament has to speak out against more more draconian EU laws uh, targeting um, Russian disinformation and election meddling, uh, which is a direct effect from like people believing that Russia interferes systematically and in large scale in for foreign elections. And this, this right. is kind of narrative is gripping people. Um, and we've seen then what happens when you start questioning some of these small dots, right? You're being targeted as exactly these stooges. One of the most recent ones of these manias was certainly Balloon Gate, right? Where, where weather balloon, and I think by now it's clear it actually was a weather balloon from China, then causes months and months of extreme fear, anger, and hate toward yes. an, a very specific enemy. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit more, this, the small dots and the big narrative and why you why you frame it as a moral, a moral issue? Yeah, well, it, it always gets, the thing is, I think that these cycles, and I allude to this in the piece, but it's not the main argument, these cycles seem to be getting more and more frequent, right? So there, there was a kind of first red scare in the 1920s that was kind of heading off of the oh, World War One problems I mentioned before. Uh, then you have World War II, but that's like more understandable why that's a bit of a scare for, for everyone. It directly impacts a lot of people. Um, and that kind of has its aftershock as, as the foreign policy establishment pivots um, to the Cold War reality in the 50s, which is McCarthyism. But these things were happening at a kind of generational interval. So now they seem to be happening every few years. And I think that if not just continuous as part of like a social media outrage cycle. And I can't help but wonder, you know, if, if that is because we live in a time where a pivot, a necessary and inevitable, no matter what anyone thinks about it, pivot towards multipolarity is just... Uh, so many people in the U.S. and in the North Atlantic in general, I think, are just psychologically unprepared to really understand what that means. I think a lot of people think it means, oh, you know, Russia and China are more assertive. I don't, but I don't think that's really what it means. I think it just means that the U.S. might retain its position as the single most influential country, but it is by a much lower margin. And therefore, it has to deal with people in a more regular way, like other countries do. It has to be very very cautious, more cautious, and very kind of cost benefit uh, as it approaches its relations. I just think that's inevitable reality. But there is just such an inability by the political media and probably some elements of the corporate like upper classes that do not understand this and cannot comprehend this. And so every single time they see a country or an opinion that doesn't mesh with this kind of a 90s consensus that that very few people under the age of 50 believe in, but but a lot of the gerontocracy still believe in. Um, there is this complete just, it, it creates like a, a an almost like a, our children are in danger, right? Right. It, it's like a, it's almost like a satanic panic effect um, where, where there is this inherent fearfulness that something unfamiliar is happening. And what does that mean? And what does it mean for us, you know, the chattering classes that are used to having people hang on our every world and have to take us seriously because we write for prestigious publications. Um, so I think it, it creates this immense amount of just fear at the world being uh, incompatible with liberal internationalism, American exceptionalism, and uh, the other ideologies that uphold this idea of teleology, this belief that the United States in particular is 
playing a role where it is helping ascend the human race towards a higher plane of existence. Um, and so it's just very hard for people uh, who have never left that ideological bubble. And those people are disproportionately represented in discourse and in policymaking. It's very, very hard for those people to uh, accept that the, the new world may be scary and new, but it is actually perfectly logical. Um, it is understandable, but to understand it, you have to acknowledge that you're no longer the protagonist. And this kind of loss of protagonist syndrome, if you will, is proving incredibly uh, painful to a lot of people. And so what's a way of almost as a defense mechanism of like recentering yourself? Well, well, it's all a big conspiracy. It's all a big conspiracy. We're still on the right side of history, so to speak. Uh, and everyone else is trying to dethrone us because they, you know, because uh, we're so effective, right? Like there's there's almost this attempt by some uh, uh, pundits I've seen recently to kind of uh, re, uh, resuscitate Francis Fukuyama and people like that by pointing and looking at other countries' systems and saying, see, they don't work that well either. <laughs> it's like, okay, but you're really bothering out here. I mean, every single country I've ever looked at in detail is dysfunctional on some level. So, uh, but there's, and I think the biggest way that you see this, and we talked about this last time I came on this, uh, on, the, on this podcast, uh, I think a huge part of this is the, um, this false narrative that geopolitics is this always ideological battle between, you know, good and evil, democracy and liberty versus authoritarianism. And uh, so anything that is critical of, say, a liberal internationalist assumptions about how the world works uh, is viewed as being pro-authoritarian and therefore in some kind of secret cabal uh, to to under undermine like uh you know u.s policy or influence or whatever but like <laughs> i i am a u.s citizen and i would actually like my country's foreign policy to benefit the average citizen my my critique doesn't come from any like fetishization of a foreign country it, <laughs> it comes uh when i make a critique it comes from the fact that i think that the the grand strategy posture of the u.s is is just obsolete and it comes from a world that no longer exists and even in that back in that world had a huge cost that, that I don't think has ever been honestly reckoned with. So it, it's, but there's just, I just don't think people want to have this conversation. I think in the end, it defaults to simple fear that everything that they've been holding up for, for their whole lives might be wrong and they can't yeah. acknowledge it. Yeah, and there's, there are all of these contradictions uh, that that are should be obvious, but for some reason um, stay hidden under under some form of, fog or or whatever you want to call it i mean the united states is the richest country in the world has the highest number of uh people incarcerated i think right after china uh the it has a huge population of people in dire dire poverty in uh absolute you know uh, uh fentanyl and so on addiction there's all of these in incoherences why a country that is this rich can have a population that's that poor and at the same time then calls itself peace loving but has been for 200 years at war constantly with somebody but uh, has a narrative of being peace loving and within within that narrative there's always the good guy and the bad guy right and you can trace mm -hmm. that through history how the cowboy used to be the good guy the the the, the indian on the horse the bad guy uh when you when manifest destiny was still a thing uh then how these foreign forces were the bad guys then how imperialism was the was the bad guy when when you could take those uh, parts of those empires away um then how how the the how the enemies of your enemy are your friend who then become again the bad guy when, when they turn to terrorism and so on. There's always a good and a bad. And I think your argument uh, plays into uh, this narrative that, that that's uh, systematically kept alive through this going up and down of, um, of also uh, um, manufacturing some sort of hysteria, which is though not centrally controlled, right? It's just more of a feedback loop. Um, yeah, it's its own thing. It feeds off of itself. And, and that's like the critical... Thing. That way you can say, well, see, we're, the state isn't telling anyone what to think. And I'm like, well, yeah, technically, but we have this kind of weird consensus that that it doesn't censor anyone directly most of the time. But what it does is it just ensures who gets airtime and who doesn't, right? Who is taken seriously and who doesn't. Uh, it, it's almost like a, uh, it, it's an Overton window manufacturing process, if you will. And um, I think that's part of like the point. And these periodic moral panics 
uh, in the media about national security uh, issues are increasing, I think, because the establishment is just losing more and more control over the narrative. So uh, it definitely there's just more and more of the can you believe people think this? Can you believe people think that? Uh, can you believe there are people in Congress, no less, who, you know, want to negotiate with Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, we, and also, like, honestly, I mean, not to make it too topical, but anyone who's been paying attention to official communications that have come out of Ukraine recently has, has seen a, a very interesting tableau of un American serving the Ukrainian government, basically threatening American critics of Ukraine policy. Um, as if they're an official spokesperson, but I just got, I just saw a notification that that this is currently, their job may currently be under review because someone in the Senate must have complained to Keith. But <laughs> like, I, I just, like, this makes me like, I mean, it's funny and it's weird, but this makes me really mad on some level. It's like uh, to ha have a, a foreign country that is, I mean, is dependent on my own country for the continuance of the war to want to police internal domestic American criticism of policy towards that war. This is just like, this is really, really like not cool. And, and the fact that there will be people in the media who will say, this is great. You know, isn't this great? How brave and stunning. And it's just like, I, I, I th this is horrific to me. It, it, it is what it is. This is like a, a, an international attack on people's rights to, to voice criticism of foreign policy. Of course. And, uh, you know, we see simultaneously these non-compatible uh, um, narratives kind of uh, unfolding. And you see that one certainly wins. So you have this American citizen you're talking about, spokesperson for the the the, the English language spokesperson for the Ukrainian uh, uh, military. And then we have Gonzalo Lira, who's also a U.S. Uh, citizen who's now imprisoned in the in Ukraine and for the the crime of doing of speaking his mind uh, online, uh, which is not uh, not not adhering to the way that the Ukrainian government wants that. But at the same time, the other narratives keep saying that um, this war needs to be won by Ukraine to protect the very freedoms that they're not granting. <laughs> but yeah, so that's and, happening at the, same, then, at the same time. And then add that add that recently something that I I wrote about very recently in Responsible Statecraft. Add that to the fact that the U.S. put its thumb on the scales and in uh, in an internal power dispute in the Pakistani government because Imran Khan, former Prime Minister, said that he wanted to pursue aggressive neutrality. Uh, some people, it, I mean. The reason he got removed was domestic, but the U.S. basically was like, yeah, we're totally cool with this by the fact that, that the incoming government said, yeah, well, we'll totally, you know, uh, supply munitions to Ukraine and we won't say anything about being neutral in the conflict. And then you have to ask yourself, well, how delusional is this? Like, in what universe does a country that has so much, so many security problems in its own region, which is Pakistan? In what world should they have to prioritize European security issues? It is as ridiculous as asking Ukraine or Moldova to take a strong position on Kashmir. And, and yet this is by the U.S., which has a governing class, which views itself as the universal and eternal empire. Um, <laughs> this is all a, one giant thing. You know, all of these things are connected. And maybe it, to, for some U.S. policy goals, it might be. But for most of these countries, it's not. Politics is still local. And so you have this, this immense attempt to just manufacture consensus around there being a global struggle. Uh, and, and any opposition or even questioning of this is to sell out and, you know, quote unquote, appeasement. Yeah, and it's it's a struggle between good and bad. That's what brings us back to to the moral issue. And if you want to see something truly delusional, I recommend everybody watching the recent uh, um, speech that uh, Anthony Blinken gave at uh, John Hopkins uh, University. He sounds like an apple. Uh, it sounds like an Apple uh, 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 sales pitch for like, you know, it's getting better and better and even better. And we're so good, uh, but we even get better. We push the envelope, we push the limit, we push the, you know, this kind of speech. And th th that's where I then wonder, you know, 
do they believe it themselves or not? I keep I keep circling back to that, but it's is it possible that they believe this narrative themselves while the same Blinken, uh, you know, foreign office kind of tries to imprison Julian Assange for 170 years, right? This is it's so it's so blatant and um connected to that maybe what happens when it tips because we know every once in a while the narrative flips right that's what happened to mccarthy it flipped mm -hmm. and then suddenly people kind of kind of realize that whoa this wasn't good um what happens in this moment and how do the elites rescue themselves when that happens yeah well this is actually one of the advantages of, of any multi-party system is that you can always kind of uh, replace who your front people are <laughs> when circumstances change. It actually is a, 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 a very useful adaptation for, for the institution as a whole, if not the individuals. And I wouldn't be surprised if there comes a flip on Ukraine, mostly probably just due to uh, exhaustion and, and how much money it keeps to, to, to usually paid internally into the, the military industrial complex in, in the U.S., but <laughs> how much money it takes to keep this going, and it's going to work its way into yearly budget disputes. I mean, I've been hearing rumors. I, I don't think, I don't know how likely this is, that there might be a government shutdown uh, with uh, as a protest against uh, Ukraine funding. So there's, these things will come up one thing I'm increasingly thinking about, this is a very new train of thought for me, so I don't have this super fleshed out, but just seeing this and seeing this entitled commentary come out of uh, other NATO countries too, um, I'm thinking that something that might really make people change their minds is a lot of the Western volunteers um, in the Ukraine war coming home. And I think there's this blind spot where people think that uh, stuff like jihadists in the Fry Corps, that only happens to right-wing people. Um, and I think that it could happen to any group of people, right? Any disaffected group of people that went abroad in search of a fight that perhaps was not their own, and then suddenly are back home uh, with who knows how much weapons training, who knows what weird connections internationally, uh, what ideologies they might believe in. And so, you know, here comes the Reddit fry core. Um, <laughs> I just, I, it's something that I think that could have an impact on how people perceive things too, is is the kind of like inherent weirdness of the international volunteer uh, uh, level of this conflict. Um, another thing I think is is just in general, uh, the narrative that the whole world is behind us right now is clearly collapsing continuously. And so I think the longer the war goes on, the less likely it will be like, well, we're, we're fighting for democracy there, so we don't have to fight for it here. I mean, I don't know how many people really take that seriously, but <laughs> there are people that do. And um, I would say as many people uh, in NATO allied countries as in the US proper. And um, some countries I think seem to have made it their entire like thing, like Germany, for instance. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's a, <sighs> Yeah, I think there's a bunch of little things that will come. And then there will be this kind of oh, whoopsie, like maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, we were we were right to want to make it costly for Russia, but um, to do this, uh, which is a position I can be sympathetic to, because, you know, if the more costly these kinds of interventions are in general, I think uh, the more people have to factor that in, in any country, I think that that might be good uh, for peace in the long run. But it, it's now pivoted towards this whole, like, this existential battle based around a what is now devolved into a territorial war and <laughs> and it, I, I just think that there's there's going to be some kind of reckoning it'll probably start with the republicans in the domestic front when it comes to the u.s um and it'll kind of go on from there and maybe you'll see some more of the the the, the anti-establishment kind of left uh, in the u.s what remains of it uh might attach itself to that because we do see some collaboration we saw a lot of uh the the squad voting with uh the kind of um uh, matt gate side of the republican party to pull out of syria unfortunately they yeah. did not succeed in that vote but you're starting to see more things like that occur so you know i think as the war just grinds on and becomes more obvious that it is a grind and not this existential battle uh you're gonna see more of this turn and then then they'll a nuanced discussion will be allowed to happen again once it's too late, right? Like in a sense, well, everything is allowed once it's too I, late. And then we'll have a new issue that we melt yeah. down about later, which might be Taiwan. It might be, you know, who knows? 
<laughs> yeah, no, 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 uh, absolutely. That that's the big danger, right? From your piece, you're kind of showing how the how these intervals are getting shorter and shorter, and they they the new interval then tends to rescue the old one by basically putting it into oblivion, right? The the uh, the, the pullout of Afghanistan was kind of you didn't need to talk about that anymore because Ukraine happened, and uh, let's not forget what Kurt Metzger, a great uh, great American comedian, uh, reminds us of that you know. For all the bad that Putin did, we need to we need to thank him for ending uh, COVID. The the COVID frenzy was completely taken over by the new <laughs> thing, right? By by the Ukraine yeah. thing. Suddenly, it was not uh, uh, take the vax anymore. It was the it was uh, the Ukraine flags in all of the social media profiles. Um, yeah. And you you have these frenzies, and we already know where the next one is going to be, right? It's clearly utterly in the Pacific. So uh, this is. Unless it's in Africa, because, you know, the, the, the thing is, <laughs> the thing is, Taiwan is the obvious candidate, and it, I'm sure eventually it will happen. But the U.S., the, China is the only country that, that even the most hubristic elements of the U.S. has to be cautious around. And so you've seen a, a trend, I think, especially since the war on terror era and the Arab Spring, especially, of like when, when you're not quite sure and you're not 100 percent certain about poking the Chinese you really kind of focus more on the developing world. Yeah. And I mean, when you look at what's going on in, in the Sahel countries right now, um, and the kind of some of the commentary coming from like the Westoid side of things about that, um, I wouldn't I, rule that out. I I would rule it out on the basis that Americans and Europeans, we just don't care enough about that continent. That's just, there's no, there's no emotional attachment to it in the way that it is to other places, because we see the racist element, right? In Ukraine, you could see very clearly how this whole, how white people with blonde hair fleeing a war caused a way bigger re emotional reaction toward them than, than it did in the case of Syria. So in my view, if, but it still caused a very big emotional reaction in Syria, a very a detrimental one to the discussion around that conflict. And I mean, don't let's not forget Kony 2012. Uh, let's not forget that there was clearly a push before the Ukraine war broke out. Uh, there was clearly a, a kind of almost pro-interventionist press push that was building uh, around the Ethiopian uh, civil wars in Ethiopia. Um, the U.S. has has often been very uh, TPLF friendly, so that's not really yeah. surprising. True, true. But uh, so so this exists. Like, don't rule. I'm I'm not I'm not saying this is like a guarantee or anything, but like I wouldn't rule this out either, especially because like you're really taking it up to the uh, up to the edge point when you're directly kind of uh, taking part in a behind the scenes war with with a nuclear power right so maybe some of these people want to go back to uh yeah, regime change uh government flipping in, in more defenseless parts of the world I, it can't be ruled out i don't think it'll be like an official military regime change operation i think they know everyone is so sick of that now that's like the most unpopular thing they could do but when it comes to sanctions uh when it comes to kind of like weird little base building coalitions in regions like yeah you're gonna see weird weird stuff i think yeah. in certain parts of the world it's the other thing is why why i don't think it will be africa is because i do see that there's still a very very strong neocon argument of trying to seriously mess with iran after all uh mm. so i would i would rule iran more likely as a kind of a a replacement uh of uh, uh, foreign foreign intervention than like let's say if you're right that china is a bit too big that Iran could then seriously destabilize the entire BRICS uh, uh, um, strategy of, of Russia and China. And I could see how neocons could spin that into something very, very uh, delicious for them. Um, well, I mean, there's nothing neocons hate more than Iran. I, I think that, like, and they, they also want a more unequal fight, and, and they, they just have a, a multi-generational hatred of Iran. Uh, I, back in 2021, I wrote a piece about how Iran's geopolitical situation, I think this was for the national interest, uh, basically dictates that Iran is a great candidate for being relatively non-aligned to the great powers. It's like one of the best candidates for that. And I kind of think secretly deep down inside that that is what they want to do. They could make more money selling their oil that way. They they have a very secure, uh, defensible homeland. Um, they have a lot of unstable neighbors. It just makes sense. But the thing that will always stop them from doing that always is the u.s always pushing them 
to seek powerful friends to counteract the U.S. attempts to topple the government. And so it, it's I actually think it's probably one of the, if not perhaps the biggest uh, U.S. foreign policy mistake that's been going on for the past couple of decades is just endless antagonism towards Iran. Like, I actually think it would be in the U.S.'s best interest if they understood anything about like balance of power and like, uh, you know, people not being able to expand their influence at your expense. It would be in their interest if Iran was a, a country we had normal relations with and therefore could be more non-aligned towards Russia and China. But they're just so blinded by this conception that Iran is behind all of the problems <laughs> and that they did the sour grapes that they have about 1979 and and they just cannot like go like that happened that happened years before I was born and I I mean I'm I'm a historian first I'm not discounting history or whatever but like the idea that the the Iranian revolution should be dictating uh how we view Mid Middle East policy and, and our sour grapes about it is just just so ridiculous to me. No, it's just the insult that that any any country dares to get rid of an of a government that was installed successfully by the by by Washington, right? That the, the yeah, <laughs> but that, but that's the neocon thinking. But to end this interview, I would like to draw uh, everybody's attention to kind of the positive spin you give this um, that media can also be the way out, right? And you're citing this uh, this example of that TV show, uh, Good Night and Good Luck, um, was the center. That the guy used what was the, what was it called? Yeah, so um, I because I kind of compare in the article, I compare different um, uh, phases of McCarthyism with each other to, to kind of see how they how they similar they are. I wanted and I was writing a lot of very negative things about the national security media. I wanted to kind of talk about things that were more positive, and and one thing that I fixated on. Because originally, actually, the piece was a lot less ambitious, and it was going to be more of a film review. Uh, so it's it's a, a bit of a dual piece. So it has this extended section on it about the uh, 2000, I believe, 2005 film "Good Night and Good Luck," uh, which is a George Clooney film shot all bl in black and white about uh, Edward R. Murrow's uh, uh, turn at basically single-handedly destroying McCarthy on live television. And um, this was a movie that came out at the height of the war on terror period and right before everyone had realized they hated Bush, right? Like 2005 was like the last year where there was like this, this, this belief in somewhat unity, right? Before things really turned <laughs> and all, basically everyone in my age demographic just really turned hard against the government. But um, so this movie was a bit ahead of its time. And it was very much about McCarthyism. It was about kind of pushing back on a culture of perpetual fear uh, coming from the government and infecting the media. And it's, an, it, it's a brilliant film for the fact that it actually uses, like McCarthy plays himself. Like there isn't an actor who plays McCarthy. They, they just have his actual footage. And then, you know, the actors are in the new studio responding to it as historical figures. Uh, but McCarthy is played by himself. And uh, looks like a total idiot. And <laughs> and uh, the the movie is just really good about like how media and journalism can fight back. And the original title of the piece, which then got downgraded to a subheading title, but it's still in there, uh, which was actually a suggestion by my friend uh, Mike Laus. Um, and, and that title was uh, How the Media Ditched Murrow to Marry McCarthy. And that is ultimately kind of the theme here, right? Is that so many people that are supposed to be critical of power have actually become its biggest handmaidens. And uh, this particularly hurts our, our sense of public conversation. And uh, this film that came out in the height of like war on terror period is just such a great example of like, here's what the media could be like, we could challenge these things. All it really takes is understanding like, yeah, sure, we want ratings, we want whatever, but we, we can do so in a way that actually pushes back against many um, narratives that come out of the government. And why that's relevant to us now is because we're now in this new manic phase, but we actually have, once again, by, by fictional media, but well, not really fictional, but media portraying historical events with some creative license, we actually do have another thing now, and that's often. Now you can say what you want about the Oppenheimer movie, about like maybe the fixing on this and not that, whatever. But the thing is we were not in the mainstream before this movie came out, we were not to anywhere near the level we are now having a discussion about the dangers of nuclear escalation. 
this movie, which has been enormously successful, and I think it's really, really good. Like, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and, and, and Killian Murphy is actually my favorite actor, and I'm not the person who normally has favorite actors, so that says something. Um, like, he does an amazing job. You know, the movie is great. I really liked it, uh, but I think most importantly, this movie has people really wrestling with the ethical questions about the atomic bomb. Uh, it, it, the movie is very good at not really taking a, a, a allowing you to think for yourself, but but definitely wrestling with what are the implications of this and how does it change foreign policy. The movie also actually has McCarthyism as a major theme. In it. Like half the movie is actually about how Oppenheimer lost his security clearance due to his old leftist connections before he developed the bomb and the, the kind of anti-establishment opinions he always had. And um, so it's it's a really good example of that. That it's a great way to talk to people who don't know that much about foreign policy, but maybe who have seen the movie or are interested in seeing it and how it relates to the. And this is to me is what the usefulness of this kind of like nonfiction entertainment can be. It can really start discussions that maybe you're not seeing talking heads in the media have. And if the journalists aren't going to do their job, well, then maybe entertainers have to do it. And uh, it, it's. We got to start somewhere. And and the fact that that movie exists and is successful and has people talking about these issues, much like how Good Night and Good Luck was very successful when it came out in 2005 and also presaged a turn against the dominant narrative then, it makes me think that there's at least the chance that we can push against the dominant narrative now. Uh, the only problem with that, of course, that I don't have an easy... Uh, the uh, solution to is, as I mentioned before, these cycles of mania seem to be happening more and more and more. So on some level, we need to have a kind of ongoing response <laughs> rather than just a, a per issue response. We have to be able to kind of have a thing that automatically pushes pushes back in a way, just understanding that there is this natural hysteria that seems to come from foreign policy uh, establishment circles. Yeah, and kind of establish a, a a a radar for that. That that you know that people start that it starts blinking when you start seeing a new one of those, a new balloon thingy, or a new kind of the, the red scare that you that a lot of people go like, okay, this is probably a mania. Let's not go along with it right now. If we get to that, we we might get up to a solution. And we do have people who speak out against it, right? Uh, on yeah. on on a lower level, we have Joe Rogan, etc., who have massive massive following. So it's not that people don't are not interested in in figuring out how things really work it's more like it's it's at the moment difficult because you don't know who to trust <laughs> there is a hunger for divergence you know there is a hunger for things that are not crazy you know like but are but are skeptical of of the main line uh that retain their critical thinking and i think there's a huge market there honestly that, that is underexploited and I think there's a lot of potential for growth there um, in, in any way. I think foreign policy is the place where it's most important because obviously in the end, you're dealing with consensus building on issues that could very well be life and death in certain parts of the world. Yeah. So it's it's a, of imperative that there be a constant cultivation of critical thought, not just a situational one. Oh, you know, everyone's freaking out. We have to do the immediate response again. I think one thing that actually might be useful uh, too is like, kind of cautionary counterexamples. Like one person who I think in in this article for Agon uh, gets one or two paragraphs is Keith Olbermann. Now, the reason I specifically want to mention Keith Olbermann is because I'm talking about Murrow, you know, like, and, and if anyone ever saw Keith Olbermann's show back when he was on MSNBC, like a long time ago, like we're talking like uh, late 2000s, early 2010s, um, he was, he started out as a breath of fresh air. He, he was one of the first people on cable TV to just come out and furiously denounce Bush. And, 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 it, and when he did it, this is the constructive part, he showed that there was a market for it. Like people were afraid of that, what would happen. And then he did it and it actually saved that dying net, uh, temporarily. It got more people watching them. It got people interested. Um, it made him, it rose his profile. Um, it was good to see mainstream pushback against that. But he's also a cautionary tale because this guy, and he would sign off his own, um, his broadcast, his old show broadcast by saying good night and good luck, which is what uh, uh, Murrow would always say when he signed off his show. So he was clearly going through the Murrow shtick, right? Of course, Murrow's famous for kind of deflating McCarthyism. What happens when Trump gets elected? Keith Elberman becomes the most insane Russia gator, <laughs> the most totally unhinged, 
lunatic who accuses everyone of being like personal puppet of Putin. Um, it constantly just really like meltdown, like in the tabloid sense of the phrase, just absolutely the guy lost his, everything about him is gone. Anything that might've been, you know, interesting about him is gone. And it really just goes to show if, if you allow yourself to be morally manipulated by things, you can go from, from Murrow into McCarthy on the individual level. You can literally yeah. become, a, make that. And, and that, that is incredibly like we, what we really need to do is cultivate uh, a sense of distance that enables people to just not be like that, right? Even if they, they start out critical, um, they don't, something unexpected happens and just throws them for a loop. This is why I don't think it's a good idea to think in this moral panic way, because it just makes you so easily manipulated by just events. Yeah, absolutely. Breathe through, stay calm, and then uh, analyze the situation for what it is and not what you want it to be. Uh, in yeah. this sense, uh, Chris Mott, that was a, a wonderful talk. So uh, good night and good luck. Yeah, good night and good luck.